Okay, we are live with Alexander Mercutis in London. Alexander, how are you doing? Very well. I'm delighted to be here again. And we are very honored and very happy to have with us once again, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis from Daniel Davis Deep Dive on YouTube. Lieutenant Colonel Davis, how are you doing today? And is the YouTube channel the best place to follow you? Uh, I, I am doing really well and, and absolutely delighted to be here as well and very grateful for the opportunity. Uh, love to be on your show. It's, it's one of the better ones I've seen on on, uh, on YouTube. And we're we're aspiring to follow in your footsteps. Uh, mm -hmm. And yes, the Daniel Davis Deep Dive on YouTube is definitely the best place to find us. That's where uh, I put all of my uh, stuff. Uh, uh, it goes up there, all of our different videos, whether it's a solo or some of the guests we have. Uh, so, yeah, that's where we're at. Great. And that is in the description box down below. And when this live stream is over, I will have it as a pinned comment as well. Definitely check out the uh, the Deep Dive channel. It is a fantastic channel. And I was watching it yesterday. And we're going to talk about one of the videos that, uh, that you put out yesterday, which is a very fascinating uh, video. But before we get to that, let me just say a quick hello to everyone that is watching us on Rockfin, Odyssey, Rumble, YouTube and the Duran.locals.com. And hello to all of our fantastic moderators, Valley S, Spartan Warrior Queen, Peter Zarael, and Tish M. And I think that is everybody. We got a we got a lot of moderators here today. Thank you very much for everything that you do. The the best moderating team on the interwebs. Alexander, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis. I believe we are going to split this live stream in, in two parts, talk about two different uh, conflicts. So, Alexander, Lieutenant Colonel, the floor is yours. Two different conflicts, two different presidents. So we're going to start with the United States and we're going to go to the president's State of the Union address and some of the things that he said about the Israel-Gaza situation and the Middle East, because on one of his videos, which you can find at Daniel Davis Deep Dive, you will find a forensic taking apart of the things that the president, the president of the United States said about the kind of things that he's going to do about the Gaza situation. And there were three things. There were three things that came across uh, um, over this program, three three items, if you like. The first is this idea about the peer. We were given to understand that this is something that the president has ordered, he's decided to do it, it's clearly comes from within the administration. That was certainly the impression I got when I was listening to the presidential speech. So his idea, the president's idea about the peer. The second about the idea of a two-state solution and the fact that everybody apparently is united in support of it including it seems the government of israel at least that was again the impression that i got from listening to the president and the third which is something completely new to me something i've never come across before which is the president say that he was going to have a jesus moment with or jesus meeting with prime minister netanyahu of israel this was in a conversation that was picked up in a hot mic moment but anyway colonel davis has been looking at all of these three things and he has discovered facts which suggest that every single observation of mine made the president's idea about the peer everybody's support for the two-state solution the jesus moment well they're all wrong in fact we got it all the wrong way around. So shall we start with the peer? Tell yeah. tell us what you found out about the peer. So you had this this uh, really curious moment, really. I, I think uh, in this the uh, State of the Union speech, where first of all he goes on this uh, rather lengthy description of how horrifically the Palestinian people are suffering, and talks about a lot of the details about that, about how it's it's intolerable, it can't be. Con continued on and all that. And every bit of that, uh, for your viewers who, who may not know, was directed at his base, at his Democratic base, because there was a huge problem in a, in a couple of recent elections, especially in Michigan and Minnesota, where large portions of his support 
uh, voted for uncommitted instead of him in the primary election uh, in preparation for the, the general election to come later this year. Uh, and that got his attention because they are really upset that he is doing nothing to actually help the Palestinian people and is allowing so many of them to be killed in Israel's otherwise reasonable attack against the Hamas terrorists who, who hit them last October. But the way that he's been going about it is just horribly off track and Biden's doing nothing. And they're really upset about it. And it's not just the Muslim Americans, but it's just Americans generally, because they just can't imagine how so many children and women could be killed in the process of this. So he, first of all, threw them a bone by saying, yes, I hear you. I heard your voices and I recognize it. But then he says, OK, and so I'm going to do something about it. And I have ordered, which was the phrase he used, I have ordered the U.S. military to begin to have this to build this floating pier to where we can flood large scale uh, aid into the Gaza Strip to relieve some of this pressure. It's interesting that he didn't say a word about holding Netanyahu accountable for that, uh, you know, illegal large scale loss of civilian life. Didn't say anything about that, but he did say we're going to be directed the U.S. military to do this. Well, as it turns out, uh, the, the Israeli media published a couple of days later, I think it was, an article that said this is actually Netanyahu's idea. He's been trying to get this done <clears throat> since last year and has been brought, brought it up a several times here. And so now apparently finally Biden decides to do this. And this is bizarre to me on a number of levels. First of all, why is the American president sending American military power to do something that a foreign government told him to do or suggested, whatever word you want to use. The bottom line is Netanyahu had the idea. President Biden put it into action with American military power to get it done. But there's a much bigger issue than that in that you're taking the most expensive, long delaying process. It's, it'll take about two months before this actually gets set up and then uh, uh, aid is going to be able to be flown in or flow in. Why would you to go to all of that trouble instead of just telling Netanyahu, open the damn gates and roll the trucks in today? There are hundreds of, of, uh, of trucks, Alexander, that could go in this afternoon if Israel just opened the door, the gates that are already there, or if they open new holes in the, in the fences. They could roll it in today. Why do you want to wait two months and do something that's very expensive? And by the way, you have an, an issue here where you know, Biden in that same speech in declared no American boots on the ground. OK, well, if you don't have American boots on the ground, then who's going to did it? Who's going to from the time it gets to the shore? How's that food going to be distributed? Who's going to take care of that? Or are you going to have mobs on the beach like you did a couple of weeks back when we saw that disaster unfold, when everybody swarmed the trucks that did come in in that point? You know, how's that going to work? And of course, you're going to have to have some boots on the ground, right? Because you're going to have to build the pier on the ground in the strip. So this gets really messy. But every way you want to look at this, it's not the way he portrayed it. It wasn't his idea. It's somebody else's idea. And it's the worst way you can get help to the people. Absolutely. And of course, the other thing is that he gave a completely false impression. And I mean, that is for me, perhaps the worst thing of all, because I thought when I heard it that it was his idea. He gave me that impression and he gave that impression to Congress and he gave that impression to the American people. And it Absolutely. turns out it's not. Now, any thoughts at all about why Prime Minister Netanyahu wants this th this thing done? I mean, what I, I do. Yeah. I, I mean, number one, it relieves him of any problem, any trouble. He doesn't want to have to worry about feeding the people in Palestine. He wants someone else to do it. So it's not his problem. He doesn't have to worry about it. So it's a lot less trouble for his forces on the ground to have to manage and negotiate. Uh, but secondly, I fear that he's wanting that delay to come in so that his troops can finish the job as he sees it, in Rafa, because he claims that they still need several weeks of military operations to uh, allegedly get the last four battalions of Hamas fighters that are that are reportedly down there. Uh, as I have said every time I've talked about this, there is no military solution to this. Netanyahu thinks in his mind that he's about to win a military victory, a complete victory is his phrase, in weeks, not months. But he is blind to what he's doing because in going after Hamas the way he has and killing tens of thousands 
of innocent people, destroying the ability of, of the other two million people to even live in this area afterwards. He has created such hatred and animosity towards Israel that dwarfs anything that existed on the 7th of October. So even if he gets the people titled Hamas off the map, if that somehow were to happen, there are so many more people that are going to uh, potentially have actions against Israel going forward and in the region that will hate Israel and their security will be worse, not better after it's over. But I think that's why he wants this, this deal because he knows it'll take a couple of months so that he can, quote, finish the job in Rafa. So in effect, he's been given time. The president has. has come along and given the impression to the American people that he's doing something to allay humanitarian suffering Correct. in Gaza, whereas in reality, he's actually given another period of several weeks for Prime Minister Netanyahu and his government to do things in Gaza, which is going to make the humanitarian situation and, and look, Gaza, it, the, worse. There are kids starving to death by the day right now. It's now gotten beyond the point to where it's close to it. It's now over. Why would you want to do something that's going to take two months mm -hmm. to get food in there when it could happen this afternoon? That's the bizarre thing to me that's just so aggravating. What, what will happen if they do attack uh, Rafa in the way that they say they will? I mean, it, it, we, we discussed, uh, we did a program, we were on a podcast together with David Sachs and Elon Musk and others. Um, and, and and I remember you describing very accurately what would happen. This is before the Israelis began the ground operation in Gaza. You described there very accurately what would happen. And it has happened pretty much as you said. What will happen if they do launch this attack on Rafa? Are we going to see the same things all over again? Hundreds, thousands of people killed, more devastation, more things of that kind, more bombing? Right. Yeah. And, there, and there's no other way for it to turn out but that way, because there's nowhere for them to go. I mean, in the early part, when it was in the, the Gaza City and they told them to go south and then when it was the Yan Kunis, they told them to again to go to Rafa. Well, now there's nowhere to go that's not already blown up. So there's nowhere to go to to even live, to, to get out of the way of some of this stuff. And unfortunately, we've seen many occasions where Israel told people to go to certain places and then they get bombed when they get there. But right now, there's no path. There's so much rubble everywhere. There's nowhere for them to go to get out of there. Yeah. And, and, and if some of them won't be able to leave, and if Israel goes in anyway, and Netanyahu claims that he absolutely is going to do that, then you have the problem to the likelihood that you're going to get a big spike in the casualties. And it's already well north of, I think, 35,000 dead and 70 something thousand wounded. Maybe it's even more than that now. Yeah. But you, that's going to spike even higher than it is. Uh, and this is, I, I come back to what I said. I don't like, I mean, personally, I don't like being subjected to this kind of manipulation, being told that something is the president's idea and it's tended to make things intended to make things better when it seems instead that he's intended to facilitate something completely different and it was somebody else's idea in the first place that's my own view shall yeah, we move to the just imagine yeah. if, if he was yeah. honest about that and said um i'm gonna put the u.s military to do this complicated mission very expensive and time consuming that president netanyahu asked me to do uh, of course he would be kicked out of office i mean there'd be protests by the day but instead he doesn't tell them that part. He doesn't tell them that that buys Netanyahu two more months of time. And he claims that it's to the contrary to help the poor suffering people when it's going to help them, more of them die, and it's going to delay them getting life-sustaining food. It's the opposite of what he claimed is going to be the result. It's it's mind-blowing. Yeah. Now, he also he has been very big over the last couple of weeks about the two-state solution. And he gives the impression there is an international consensus behind this. And he seemed to imply that, you know, eventually the Israelis would come round. But, well, you've looked into this, not into things that Prime Minister Netanyahu has been saying in the past, but things that Prime Minister Netanyahu has been saying recently about the two-stage solution. What was two state solution, Rob? What has Prime Minister Netanyahu been saying about yeah, the two so, state solution? So as, as I, I've detailed on, on my channel several times uh, over the months, 
uh, many times. Biden specifically has said, yes, a two-state solution is the only path. And then some uh, Israeli official almost always comes behind and, and says, no, there's not going to be one. Absolutely not, to, to, to quote one of their former ambassadors, uh, you know, and, and unambiguously saying no. And Netanyahu a few times implying no. But two days after Biden's declaration that a two-state solution is the only alternative, uh, Netanyahu goes on Israeli television when the, the videos are out there to where he says the people in Israel are behind me and agree with me that they don't want anyone shoving down our throat a Palestinian state, which is not going to happen. So he says point blank, whatever he said, they're trying to shove it down my throat. It ain't happening. We're going to there will be no Palestinian state. That's not even on the cards, because, as he said, a week or so, a couple of weeks before that, you know, that would be rewarding terrorism or whatever. And so he's going to move forward with whatever he's his view is, as he said, from the river to the sea, meaning West Bank, Pal the Gaza Strip. He's going to control everything. That's not a two state solution. That's basically imprisoning five million people. Yeah. And the president presumably knows the prime minister Netanyahu is opposed to a two stage two state solution. I mean, he must know this. I mean, he's if, if it's out there in public. Of course. And of course, he has all of these meetings with prime minister Netanyahu. But he then talks about the fact that he's going to have. Sorry, is it the Jesus moment or Jesus meeting? I can't remember. But he's going to have one of these things. Apparently, where can you explain to us what that means to us yeah. in England? We don't know. But it looks as if he's going to talk tough to prime minister. That's right. Netanyahu. That's what he said. It's a, it's a phrase that, uh, especially in the south where I grew up, they use a lot. It says, "We're going to have a come to Jesus meeting," which means like I'm going to lay the law down. That's the, and I'm going to tell you what the heck's going on. That's the implication of that. And the, the normal usage of it. And boy, he sounded tough on the floor when he's saying that. But uh, again, when you see Biden say, yeah, here's your come to Jesus meeting. Uh, hell no. This is what he point blank told him. He's going to do whatever he wants to do and he's not going to listen to anybody. So it just, in my view, just humiliated the president of the United States and shows that he has no power to even influence an ally. Uh, and we have plenty of leverage we could use, but instead he's doing the opposite of just submitting to whatever Netanyahu said. And I just, it just blows my mind. I cannot understand why we would do that. Well, it seems to me is that to the extent that there are come to Jesus moments, it's, it's prime minister Netanyahu who is bringing them to the president of the United States. I think that's a fair it, it is he who's laying down the law here because the president of the United States ends up always doing what prime minister Netanyahu wants. Um, we, we've not seen any progress towards a two-state solution. And, of course, we going back to our earlier discussion, we're going to get this peer, which is what Prime Minister Netanyahu has wanted for months. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is, it is just hard to fathom the depth to which the U.S. is submitting to the desires, if not the commands, uh, of a foreign head of state to include our money from, from Congress, our our weapons and ammunition in large numbers continue to flow in there. And now then you see the physical deployment of our armed forces in support of a, a foreign head of state uh, against our own interest. I, I don't get it. No, I don't get it. I mean, I, ultimately, I don't get it either. Do you see anything good coming out of this affair? Because, of course, people are eventually, a lot of people are going to work it out. I mean, you're there explaining it already, but, uh, you know, over time, people will see that this fighting goes on, that they will gradually work out that the peer isn't doing what it's intended to do. And of course, the two state solution will not come. Will that eventually have an effect either in the Middle East or in Israel or especially specifically in the well, United States? Well, once that peer is up and functioning, there's ever reason to think that it will finally get large scale uh, food in. So in that regard, at least in a near term thing, there is some hope for food for whoever's still alive at that point. And there's no question that there's going to be many hundreds and almost certainly thousands who are alive today who will be dead before that support gets. But once it does get in, it will help. But the, the medium and long term are all bad. Because the, the policies that Netanyahu is, is pursuing, that we are supporting, will backfire. 
it will backfire against Israel. It'll backfire against the United States. It's already resulted in three of our soldiers being killed because of the backlash that it caused of the attacking of our troops that were in Jordan at the time. And that's only likely to continue. It's it's kind of slowed down for a while, but only I'm sure because they're re calculating how they want to go about it so that they don't get blown up in the process, but they're certainly not going to go away. And the more Palestinians keep dying, they're just going to keep going this direction. And the problem is Netanyahu, as long as he's in power, holds all the cards and there won't be any possibility of a two state solution as long as he's in power there. Uh, and, and Hamas, I think is, is no one will, will do any business with them at any point. So Palestine's going to have to find a new political entity out of the people who live there now that, from which negotiations can even be made, uh, which is another problem because the, the you know the Hamas is not doing anybody in Palestine any favors. I mean, they deserve a lot of condemnation for what they're doing too, because the Palestinian people are the bill payers for all of the both of the governmental entities that are existing there, uh, which is why it's so anguishing to me. And the United States used to be the one you would count on in in the world to that's going to go help these helpless people who are powerless and being killed, and instead we're perversely providing the ammunition for their demise. Uh, it just, I, I just can't get my head around this. No, I mean, the other thing that I mean, I find very difficult to understand is what exactly the administration, the U S governments, I'm talking about the, the, the Biden administration's actual policy for the middle East altogether is because can you touch a little on what's going on with Yemen? I mean, I, I understand that, bombing is still going on in Yemen. The president tells us it's not going to change anything, but apparently we must go on doing it. It is clearly linked to the events in Gaza, but we see that he's not really doing very much. Yeah, about it's, Gaza. it's expressly linked. I mean, the, the, yeah. the Houthis expressly say this is directly in support of the Palestinian people. And all of it started after uh, the large scale death started occurring there. It's precisely linked. And we have basically open, embarked on an open-ended war. The Saudis went for almost a decade trying to subdue the Yemenis, and despite all of their substantial uh, power in the air and their technological advancement over the, the Houthis, they were never able to, to subdue them. We're not going to be able to do it either. We just had this open-ended fight where it's going to continue on for some indeterminate period of time. But the bigger issue, which you kind of touched on there, there's no strategy. We don't have a plan that says, here's what we want to accomplish in the Middle East, and here's how this coordinates with it, and this is connected. There's none of that. There's just reaction. Well, we're reacting to the, the, the Red Sea thing because I guess we're supposed to. Even though China and Asia is the, are the biggest beneficiaries of, of our actions there to try to keep the Red Sea open, because most of it is, is from the Asia than even the United States. Uh, but that's a separate issue, I guess. But you see, we have no plan. We just react to stuff. And yeah. why do we have troops on the ground in Syria and Iraq? There's nothing in our national security at stake. Why did we leave those people there so that three of them were killed recently and the rest of them are, I don't know, what are they doing? There's no strategy. There's no plan. Yeah. And there definitely isn't a plan for the Middle East in terms of Israel and the, and the Palestinian issue. Since we keep claiming it's a two-state solution with our mouth, but with our actions, we say we're supporting the guy who says there is no two-state solution. So you see the significant yeah. mismatch between ends, ways, ends, and means, and we just have no vision. It's I, terrible. I mean, the other, the other thing to say, Jen, this is my last point here, which is that what you're describing is drift. At least that's how it looks to me. And drift in this particular region, in this kind of way, is inherently dangerous. I mean, there's always a risk that something is going to happen which can't be controlled easily. I mean, I, I, I'm sure you can remember it. I mean, I can remember what happened when the US put troops in Lebanon, for example, in, was it 1982, 1983? Yeah, I mean, you know, sooner or later, I mean, I, I don't want this to happen. I hope it doesn't happen. But sooner or later, somebody's probably going to try something like that. I mean, this is that kind of a region, I would have thought. And you don't want to be without rudderless and without a strategy in a region like this, or so it seems to me. And, you know, and there, there are so many in the United States that want to exacerbate this problem by saying, you know what, John Bolton did this a couple of days ago. 
you know, you guys are missing the the elephant in the room. All this isn't even about Israel Hamas. This is about Iran. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who are driving all of this. And if we don't go after Iran, we're never going to solve this. And there's so many people who just almost have this lust for war with Iran, and they somehow think that fighting Iran or blowing up something in Iran is going to somehow solve the problems. And it's just blows the mind to think that you didn't learn anything from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And you think you can go and do a regime change operation in Iran or, or, or just lob a few missiles and they're going to back down and suddenly change everything. It's irrational. It's illogical. And yet they're emphatically saying that they want Biden to make even more mistakes than he has. Hopefully he'll resist that kind of activity, but there's a lot of desire for it in this country. Absolutely. And I, I, I we can, we should talk about Iran some other time, boy time, because, you know, I'd be quite interested you know, to have your views about, <laughs> to me, they look like absolutely impossible risks in attacking a country like Iran, much yeah. bigger than Iraq, completely right. different landscape, mountainous, probably more sophisticated, but definitely more sophisticated. Definitely, especially in all missiles. kinds of, yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's, let's switch to the other war, because we're waiting this evening for the address to the French people, by President Macron of France. And I have to say, I have a deep sense of foreboding about this. I think this is, you know, we're going to see another folly piled on top of all of the others. But there's a lot of suggestions that what has driven this are a series of reports which have come from the French military. And the French military have been looking at the situation in Ukraine and they've come to all kinds of conclusions which look to me to be correct, except, of course, that they're about the same conclusions that you reached about two years ago, <laughs> more than a year ago, about the kind of problems that Ukraine would run into. Now, have, are you familiar with what I'm referring to, this article that's appeared in Marianne, a French newspaper, these reports? Um, have you anything particular to say about these reports that we've got from France? Yeah. I, I'm kind of late in coming, but uh, I mean, the, the conclusions are, are self-evident on the ground. Uh, I mean, you don't have to be a military expert mm -hmm. to be able to see that Ukraine is losing the war. They threw everything in the world that they and the NATO alliance had at mm -hmm. Russia in 2023 and didn't dent the lines. And now then they're falling back. They can't recruit more people. They can't mobilize more people. They're Literally, some of the people who are grabbing people off the streets in, in Ukrainian cities, uh, some of those guys are even being killed. It's just terrible. They can't get the man manpower. And now then there is no appetite in the West to repeat what they already threw away through the first two years. So there is no path to a Ukraine even holding the line, much less winning. There's no path to that whatsoever. The question is, why are we coming to this conclusion now in the third year, the beginning of the third year of the war? And what is Macron thinking, man? What is he going to say this afternoon? I'm, I'm afraid to see that, especially with what Putin has recently said, like yeah. in the last few days. I think you're going to comment on that in a second. Uh, 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 it's just, uh, I don't know what's going on. Absolutely. I mean, let, let's actually go to Putin, because Putin's just given this interview. Stands up, as far as I can see, at very short notice. The reporter that he spoke to, Sergei Kiselyov, is about a senior in Russia, in the Russian media as it gets. He is the head of Rossiya Sivodnya, which is one of the, you know, the big Russian state media company. And it was clearly done in anticipation of what Macron looks like he's going to do. And it was all the word is that Macron is going to send troops to Ukraine. And Putin made some very stark, you know, stark comments. He said that um, if the French, he didn't say the French, but he said if they have no red lines, and that's taking it from something that Macron said, if they have no red lines towards us, we have no red lines towards them. He also said if troops enter Ukraine, we will treat them as invaders, which I thought was quite a stark uh, expression. And as far as we're concerned, they're combatants, whatever it is that their mission is supposed to be. Now, this looks very dangerous to me. I mean, by the way, what Putin is talking about here is 
thinks that he has already said. He's given these warnings, more veiled warnings before, but he's now coming out much more openly than he has ever done. Well, what is Macron thinking? What is he hoping to achieve? What can he achieve with these French troops that he's going to be sending there? Yeah, he he claimed uh, in one of his recent speeches, Macron, that the French people are at risk and their their survival is it is it in danger, and that they have to make sure that Putin loses. And of course, that's a, a canard that's been repeated throughout the West throughout these two years plus. Is that if Putin wins in Ukraine, he's coming for us. He's going to go into the Baltics. He's going to go into Poland. He's going to go into France or Germany. He's coming for us all. And that is just absurd to the highest degree. Putin has said since 2007, nothing besides if you go into Ukraine and Georgia with NATO, that's a red line for us. And he proved in 2008 he took limited military action in Georgia, which should have put to bed any thought of going any further east because there's no point in it. It's not going to increase our security. It's going to undermine our security. But we've just been blind to that. And then now, of course, you have this two year thing where Putin shows and has said out from the beginning and continues to say in recent days that this is about Ukraine on our border in uh, I'm sorry, NATO in, uh, on our border in Ukraine. It's not going to happen. Absolutely. We forbid it. And they're showing they got a full out war to do it. But they've also shown that two full years of war has only gotten about 17 to 20 percent of the eastern side of Ukraine. And they will be hard pressed even to get up to the Dnieper River. There is zero capacity to go into a NATO country. That's one country that has no alliance, no troops, no Navy, no Air Force to speak of. Uh, and Russia is struggling to get this part here. They have the decisive advantage. And now then there's it can't go back. Russia has already decisively conventionally sealed the deal. So the war is over in, in practical if it's not physically on the ground because Ukraine hasn't stopped fighting yet. But the war itself is, is concluded. There's no outcome. But they cannot like they don't have enough infrastructure. They don't have enough logistics capability. They don't have enough men. They don't have enough manpower. They don't have enough anything to attack a 32 member alliance that does have a powerful military air force missile force and nuclear weapons so putin is anything if not very uh basically wise and smart he's not stupid and he's not going to commit suicide by hitting the 32 member alliance he wants them off his border he doesn't want to go into the alliance so what macron has been using as his justification is just flat out wrong so then we have to ask what is his play? What is he thinking? Because there is no upside at all for them to do anything more than end this war. That's what we should do is require Kiev to come to a negotiated settlement, help them with try to hold the line as best they can, give them diplomatic support, give them a promise of, of future restoration and financial support, you know, whatever long term, but end the war. And instead, Macron seems to be wanting to expand it in a way that cannot cannot succeed and all it will do is increase the risk of a mistake and a tactical nuclear weapon being used that's the Absolutely. upside and there's no reason for him to do what he's anything else and, and in fact if you go to putin's interview again i mean he was talking about nuclear weapons in ways that he has never done before i mean he said he's never thought about use, using nuclear weapons up to this point but nuclear weapons that russia has are not just there for decorations. I'll tell you, they're, there's, they're there's there to a, be used. There's, there's a report in, in, in on CNN a couple of days ago to where a, a, an author, one of their national security experts, uh, wrote this book where he claims that he had from the highest of U.S. military sources and government mm -hmm. sources that in the fall of 2022, apparently uh, Russia was very close to using tactical nuclear weapons because that's when they had their big setbacks. You may recall Yes. When Ukraine really, uh, in both Kherson and in uh, Kharkiv areas, they had big tactical successes. And apparently we went to extreme lengths to assure Russia directly not to use tactical weapons. And that was a relatively small thing. If you talk now about literally sending in NATO troops uh, in any capacity, I mean, why does anyone think that he won't then use tactical nuclear weapons? It's just, it beggars belief, uh, just common sense.
Yeah. What what is what does Macron expect these troops to do? I mean, are they supposed to fight the Russians? I mean, or, or, or what else are they supposed to do? Are they supposed to stand around, you know, be there, and that's going to deter the Russians in some way? I mean, I, I, again, I don't understand the plan here. If there, if there is a plan, or is it something that Macron has just decided to do because it looks, you know, impressive in some way? Well, I, I guess we'll find out when he makes his speech today. I mean, I'm hopeful that it's it's nothing but you know a bunch of rhetoric, but doesn't result in anything on the ground because. I, I, I cannot emphasize more strongly there is no upside for France or mm. for NATO or for Ukraine to send French troops in any capacity, any capacity into Ukraine. All it will do is expand the war or extend it, but it will have no impact on the outcome, which is already settled. Mm. I I happen to happen to have met various French officers in my time. Oddly enough, I met more French officers than I've ever met British officers. I don't know why that is, but it's true. And I have to say, I found them impressive people, actually. Um, I don't know whether you've had many dealings with the French army, but I found I the French that. officer. Yeah. And I thought they were impressive, intelligent people. I can't imagine that they are happy with this. I mean, the people I knew, I, I would guess myself that they must be trying to get across to the president, to Macron, who is their commander in chief. This is a terrible idea. Why do you think he's not listening to them? Yeah, I can't imagine any any military officer who actually knows his craft and understands unemotionally balance of power, how things work. Uh, you know, look at who has what and sees the imbalance like this and sees that this would be like throwing pebbles at a brick wall, trying to knock through to, to send any amount of more aid that would come. Uh, and and here's the, the biggest issue that, that I don't think there's any way to get around. There is no scenario that conventionally that even conventional military power could somehow result in a tactical defeat for Russian forces and drive them out that would not spur a tactical response from Russia. They will not lose a war and not use any of their uh, tactical nuclear weapons. That's in their doctrine. And it's irrational to think they would do otherwise. To, to, for us to think that Russia could come and beat our armies and we wouldn't use any of our nuclear weapons, we would allow ourselves to be built, uh, defeated. We won't, neither will he. Why would you want to do something that has no chance of success? And I'm hoping that these military officers in France mm. uh, and hopefully the U.S. and Great Britain are also saying, dude, cool the jets here. Don't do something stupid because we'll all end up paying a price for it. Um, what did you make of the Germans? We've had this extraordinary, utterly bizarre. I, I mean, I, I, I found it extraordinary recording of them you know talking about tourist missiles and things of this kind. now i ha i will say this has provoked a reaction in germany i i i i've got a lot fair number of people i know in germany and they were they were horrified by this whole business and there's been a pushback and the germans seem to have decided now that they're not going to send these missiles to ukraine and that's a final decision but i mean what did you make of that? I mean, the, the fact that these people, these generals, German generals, were talking over, you know, open channels with each other, discussing things like this. I mean, right. does that often happen in I, uh, military? I, 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 military? I mean, we don't we don't really know for sure where all this came, but part of me wonders if it wasn't like a UK release and not a Russian release, mm -hmm. because you know, Schultz made a lot of enemies when when he basically threw the UK and France under the bus by saying they have had their troops on the ground helping yeah. the Ukraine doing some stuff here. And then all of a sudden it gets leaked right after that, that, well, actually, some German officers have been talking about doing some crazy stuff, too. Uh, but to Schultz's credit, and, and I have had plenty of things to, to find fault with what he's done in the past, yeah. at least he is now saying, no, we're not going to do this. Not one German soldier is going to have anything to do it. We're not going to give the Taurus. So he's standing firm on that. So he's not willing to cross that line. And, uh, you know, when we know with Orban, he's got some challenges here. We know that uh, Erdogan and, and down in the South has differences of opinion with lots of things that NATO is doing. So you have a lot of disunity in NATO mm -hmm. right now. And that's the last thing you want. If you want to have any thoughts of doing anything militarily, if you're this di divided already, that's another signal that says we need to just cut this deal off and quit make, digging ourselves a deeper hole.
What should the United States be doing in this situation? I'm not saying what they are doing, but what should they be doing? Because I can't help but think that at some level, Macron says to himself, if I send my troops into Ukraine and I get into serious trouble there and the Russians come after me, I know that my army is not going to be able to deal with this. I mean, that's the reality. Um, but I expect that the US will come to my rescue. <laughs> is this something that the u.s might feel that they have to do well um, god help us if it is but you, you ask what we should be doing and what we should do is recognize reality and tell yeah. Zelensky privately uh the the show's over uh it, we're not going to give you any more stuff there's there's no more tranches of hundreds of tanks and artillery pieces uh air defense weapon systems we're not doing that anymore so without that you there's not even a prayer that you can do anything uh, offensively in 2025, which uh, ironically is what they're thinking that they're going to try to hold the line for the rest of this year and then think they're going to do it, but it's not coming. So we'll give you money and some defensive weapons to help you hold the line. As long as you publicly say, yeah. that's it. We're going to seek a negotiated settlement. That's cutting your losses and stop the, the damage that's accruing routinely with what we're doing now is the best way forward right now because it'll result in some embarrassment. It'll result in a lot of, you know, the, the Russians will come out on top and they'll crow about that for a lot of time, but then time will pass and things will get back into some kind of normalcy. If instead we reject reality and say, no, we're still going to pursue our preferred outcome in spite of reality, what we're going to do is the chances of a yeah. expanded war will go through the roof and, and our harm will be incalculable if that happens. That's why we should do it. I don't know. Um, I don't know whether, you know, a, a, a U.S. military officer called Jim Webb, but um, he wrote. Oh, yeah, piece, yeah, I know him well. Yeah, well, he took he wrote a really good piece with George Beeb. Who, I mean, I don't know him, but George Beeb is somebody who likes lots of commentary and was, yeah, I think, very I've prominent. I had both of them on my show before, actually. Well, there you go. <laughs> anyway, they, they did a very fine article back in the summer of this year, uh, last year, right in the middle of the Ukrainian offensive. So this isn't going to work. It isn't working. So you've they Ukraine, they were advising them that Ukraine do exactly what you've just said. Go on the defensive and start negotiations. Now, you know, that that would have been a better time, obviously, to do it. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, you know, that, then if that advice had been followed then, but I, I, I was really struck by, you know, the, the sheer sanity of that article at that time. And, of course, there's been no follow-up from the administration or, of course, from the Ukrainians. Um, which is which is tragic, which is a tragedy. I just want to finish on one thing. I don't know whether you've um, seen all of Putin's interview, but his mistrust of the United States is now, um, you know, at absolutely stratospheric levels. He says at one point that I don't trust anyone. And it's clear that he's talking about the West. He even says that people from the United States and the West who come and suggest negotiations and come up with proposals are dangerous people because we've been tricked so many times before. Um, and, you know, we can't really trust these people in any way. I have to say, I my, my heart sank when I was reading all of that because it shows how very, very difficult negotiations are. And frankly um i don't think negotiations like this can happen with this administration do you think that if there's a change of administration we could perhaps start getting things going again right. um, I, sh I i should say that i uh, just quickly say that you know I, I did a program yesterday with professor mearsheimer um, and glenn deason and professor mearsheimer seemed to think that if we can reboot this whole thing with the new administration, it might be possible. Yeah, I I, I think that's the only possibility because I, yeah. I, I just think that this current administration is just ossified in its thinking and, and it can't, it, it doesn't have the flexibility to shift mm -hmm. on the fly based on changing realities. And uh, you talk about what Putin said yesterday. Well, just before I came on your show today, and I mean like literally just before, I saw a telegram post uh, by Dmitry Medvedev 
who was addressing some of these issues. And he says, well, we hear that some people in the West want to have a frozen conflict or something like that or a negotiated settlement. But right now we don't have any trust. So what is the best outcome then? He said, almost the only thing we can do is to have a military defeat of the other side mm -hmm. and then have uh, here's the, the surrender terms. And so right now they're in a position where I've been articulating and arguing that we mm -hmm. should have a negotiated settlement, like I just said, but we're getting dangerously close if we're not already there to the point to where the Russians mm -hmm. may say, I'm not even interested in that anymore. I don't, you can talk whatever you want. Now I'm only going to continue until we conquer whatever we want. And then we'll give you terms of surrender. And that would be, uh, I mean, so bad because then there'll be pressure on people like Macron to say, oh my God, we can't allow that. We have to come help mm. or some nonsensical thing like that, mm. which then we get back to the nuclear card. And yeah, it's it's a real dangerous period right now. It really is. I'm, I hope that Macron doesn't do anything rash tonight in his comments. Absolutely. Can I just say uh, one thing about Putin's interview? Despite all of that, he was careful not to slam the door completely shut on negotiations. He made it clear that he's deeply mistrustful and he wants what he calls very concrete assurances. He didn't explain what those were. And he doesn't seem to know himself, actually. Yeah, at least that I was the impression. But at least at least he didn't completely slam the door. Right. And that's anyway. why we're getting very close to that point. I, I don't think we're there yet because I, I, I agree yeah. that he left the door open. But as I've also been arguing, the longer you wait to do that, the worse conditions that he's going to impose to have a settlement. And it can get worse. And it can it, there can come a point to where they say, there is no more talk. We're just going to conquer what we want. And I'll get back to you at that point. I hope we don't get there. Absolutely. Um, Colonel Davis, this has been an outstanding program. I, I'm going to go over to Alex at this point. Thank you for all your insights today and all this information. And can I just say, from my part, please do go to Daniel Davis' deep dive. Watch that video that we were talking about at the start of the program, but also lots of other good things on that channel every day. Over Thank to you, Alex. <laughs> Absolutely. You have uh, five, ten minutes to, to take I some do. questions? Yeah. Okay, great. From, let's see here, Sir Muggs Game. Colonel Davis, how long will Russia play the geopolitical fire brigade to NATO geopolitical arsonists and their ring of fire around Russia's borders? Well, I mean, they're going to continue on as, as long as there's fire to be put out. And, and as long as we keep doing these kinds of things and, and sending in more ammunition and sending in, you know, experts or whatever and you know, we're about to add in the F-16, apparently, and there's talk now in Washington that there, we're going to add also the long-range uh, HIMARS missiles that we haven't given so far. And as long as we keep adding more fuel to the fire, Russia is going to continue adding fuel to the combat. And, uh, you know, it, it's just natural. There's no way that I, I don't know what people are thinking that somehow that's going to make Russia after two plus years of war suddenly stop and suddenly back down. I mean, it's irrational, but that seems to be a lot of that going around. Mm. Just a comment from Christian. Lieutenant Colonel Davis is the kind of American you want to hang out at a barbecue with. <laughs> you know, I'm from Texas and I love barbecue, so I'm all about that. <laughs> Fantastic. And this is coming from locals from Abby uh, Bassoni. Will the U.S. Congress be able to divorce itself from the MIC lobby in this lifetime? No, they, they will not. And until something catastrophic happens and, and and the members of Congress as a group uh, perceive more loss than gain to go to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the lobby, they're going to continue on because there's so many millions of dollars that come in from that, that don't, I uh, can't be matched anywhere else. That, that's why there's a number of good people in Congress. There really are. I, I've met some of them, uh, but they, they are not well-funded. They don't have the millions of dollars. So you never hear from them. They, when they make comments, it doesn't get picked up by the news media. Uh, and these other people who get these large, you know, backing and hundreds of thousands in their reelection campaigns. I mean, there, it's not actual bribing to where they say, look, you know, vote for the war so we can make more bombs. They just say, Hey, here's a hundred thousand dollars, $300,000 from our industry. We like what you're doing. And so you're going to automatically buy on your own, keep doing it to make them happy so that that money keeps rolling in there. And as long as the system continues the way it is, I, I don't see any evidence at all that it's going to change. There's no evidence so far. Very sadly. 
from Zariel. Colonel Davis, who actually has control over the nuclear football? The senile old man or the sick military Darth Vader? Crazy question, but we need to know. Well, at least ostensibly, it's it's still the president of the United States. And we, we have safeguards in to prevent that. So I don't I don't see any evidence that that the system itself is broken. I mean, you can certainly take issue with, uh, you know, who has control over those access codes uh, in, in the current uh, office uh, occupant of the, of the White House. But, uh, you know, we got another election coming up this year and don't have a lot of great options to go to offices at that. But that's kind of how the system is set up. Hmm. Can I just From, make a quick, uh, no. just a quick point there, which is I, I've noticed. I mean, the people who seem to be the people in the Pentagon who are closest to the control of the nuclear forces, I've tended to find them rather impressive. Actually, um, this is my own personal view, but I I don't think they're the sort of people who would want to do any kind of crazy things. That was my own sense of them. Maybe there are other yeah. people in the military you couldn't say that about, but this particular group seem to be carefully chosen and do seem to be very able. <laughs> yeah, people. I mean, as far as I'm aware, uh, I, I did work in the Pentagon for a period during my career, and, and my observations were the same from the inside, uh, that lots of people I don't agree with, especially on policies or so, but but categorically and generally speaking, I mean, the, the people still do love the country. and They, they want to do whatever they think is going to help. I haven't seen anybody that would be, you know, willing to do something really that Darth Vader ish, uh, which would undermine our entire system of government. Yeah. Uh, from Tish M, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Davis, U.S. Israel has shown its cards in every way. How can anyone respect or trust them? Well, that is a big problem. Uh, you know, the U.S. We keep saying one thing, but then doing something very different. Uh, you've had Israel. You know, I think that. If you just look, don't listen to a word they say, but just look at what's physically happening on the ground. They are unquestionably setting forth a, a policy to destroy the uh, infrastructure of the entire Gaza Strip so that it's unlivable, so that there is com there's pressure from all these surrounding governments to take the people out and to put them out, because that's that's one of the stated goals of at least some of the actual members of the Israeli government. Some of the, the ministers have said that openly, that that's what they want to do. And that is clearly what they're trying to do. But then they use because they have to keep the support of the American people, uh, especially those on the right. They keep using the language that we ourselves use on our operations. Well, we have targeted operations here. We're going after the bad guys. But, we, you know, we're being we're going overboard and trying to take care of the people. So the words are saying this and the actions are doing the opposite. And for some people, that's cool because they just listen to the words because that's what they want to be true. And they blind themselves to what's physically happening. But there's fewer and fewer of those people. And so I agree that the trust is just getting just chopped with an axe by the day. And it's not too many more whacks before all the trust is gone. And, and if you don't have the trust of the governed, then you've got some real problems no matter what the country is. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll do a couple of more, and then we will uh, let the very busy Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis go. Uh, Joe Public, I think there's a good question, actually. What is a tactical nuke? Uh, a tactical nuclear weapon uh, is is something that has a low uh, yield. So uh, it's a nuclear explosion, but it's it's relatively small. So that means that you can use it on the battlefield as opposed to like, you know, something you dropped on Hiroshima or Nagasaki or some of these theater uh, nuclear weapons, which can vaporize a city. This this will be used militarily so that it can uh, blow up something, but it's not going to destroy your own troops. And that, you know, you can actually fire some of these from artillery guns so that you can be within, you know, 15, 20 kilometers and your troops not get blown up in, in the process. But it has an incredibly big yield on the target that it hits. So it's, you know, substantially larger than any conventional bomb. And it can take out a whole area here, but not one that's going to be you know, taking out a city like, you know, Nagasaki or something. Right. All right. We got so many good questions uh, for, for you. Let's uh, let's move on here uh, from Commando Crossfire. Russia faced down a united and fully militarized Europe in 41. So I disagree with the notion that Russia is too weak to do it again. Now, the troubles they are having with Ukraine is political. This is partly a civil war. Yeah, well, there's no question that, that the, the Ukraine war is a civil war. I mean, that's how it's been since, since 2013 when the Maidan first started. 
And then in 2014, devolved into a physical civil war where the split between the Luhansk and Donetsk region and the rest of the country, you know, turned against them. And it was just, you know, terrible. And there was other areas down in Odessa, for example, where there was some horrific bloodshed uh, against the the, po- the folks who were from the east. Uh, Putin re- recalls that many times here. Uh, but the, the issue between 1941 and here, I mean, you were talking about then it was a global war. So Russia still even rhetorically calling this a special military operation to restore issues on their border. But if it ever expands beyond that and it becomes a NATO and Russia, then then you have you'll probably see that scale of things. Uh, a friend of mine, Doug McGregor, said he has some intel recently that says that uh, on the inside that Russian senior leaders are talking about how they may have to mobilize millions of, of tr- uh, personnel if this expands into a big war. And then you do have like a World War II style issue to where you have mass armies on each other. And I mean, I can't see how that doesn't end in any way besides nuclear destruction and, and devastation that we can't even contemplate. All right. Here's a good question to follow up on that. Are the stakes too high to allow an election in 2024? Uh, no, there's there's not. I mean, it's it's ironic that that Russia's going ahead with their election and we call them the autocrat. But Ukraine has chosen not to in saying that very thing that, well, you can't have it during a wartime. So we're not going to do it. Uh, and certainly the United States, there's absolutely no reason why we can't do it and, and will do it. Uh, but it's 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 just kind of really puts to show we always want to say that Ukraine is defending democracy and Russia is the autocracy. And yet who's not having an election and who is in wartime? I, I found that disappointing. All right. T- two more, just two more. We have some, so many yeah. good questions here. Uh, will the Gaza floating pier be used to bring food in or get the population out? Biden cabinet is floating the most uh, APEC in history. No way they would do this to help Palestinians, in my opinion, from Brooklyn. Uh, yeah, they will virus. do it to help Palestinians for for sure. For, for sure, that'll be the case. The, this it is definitely being designed to get people out. But I have heard that there are those who are going, hmm, that pier can work two ways, so they can get them out as well. But if Egypt and Jordan say that they're not going to take anybody because they say that that's their land and they don't want to basically be an accomplice with Israel to gen- to eradicate the land of of the people who live there. I don't know what other country would take them. So you could physically get them off, of, you know, through that pier. But to where? Where would they go? Who's going to take them? I, I can't think of any nation on the planet that's going to take them right now. And a final question from I am Valentina. Is Lebanon going to take on Israel in the big definitive way? Well, that that is an open question. And actually, there's that's been a constant back and forth between who might initiate it. Israel keeps making comments that they might initiate it. So they, they've even talked some about if there is this six week uh, ceasefire that Biden keeps saying that he wants um, that Israel at least said they're open to if they get their hostages back that they may use that opportunity to then go after Hezbollah in, in Lebanon and go all the way to the Latani River, which is about 25 kilometers deep into the country. Uh, and then, of course, there's there's also talk that maybe the Hezbollah itself could be so upset that they finally open a full-on war against Israel from the north. Um, and, and both are possible, and God help us if either one of them happens. Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis, a fantastic show Everybody, definitely follow the channel, Daniel Davis Deep Dive on YouTube. I have it as a link in the description box down below, and I will also have it as a pinned comment as well. Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis, thank you very much for joining us. On you the show. Show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having thank me you very on. Much. I appreciate it. Take I'll care. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Definitely. Take care. All right. Great show. Wow. Alexander, let's uh, let's do some, some questions. questions. Yeah, <laughs> why not? Uh, um, be interesting Lieutenant to see. Colonel I mean, Davis yeah. answered a lot of questions. Uh, I think he did. Great he answers. Did it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes. A lot of great questions for him as well. A lot yeah. of great questions. Um, yeah. What, what were you saying? No, I mean uh, technical military matters. We'll, we'll we'll see how well we can do, but we'll do our best. We'll, we'll do well. We we always we always do well. We we got the oracle. We got the oracle mm-hmm. of, of London. <laughs> Big Wyman, thank you for that super sticker. Cactus Ray, thank you for that super sticker. Sparky says, "Go Yemen, fight the power." Mm-hmm. Uh, Lana, thank you for that super sticker. Sparky says, "Every time anyone says that Israel is our only friend in the Middle East, 
I can't help but think that before Israel, we had no enemies in the Middle East. This is from U.S. missionary John Sheehan. You're absolutely correct. If you go, if, I, I read many accounts about you know the history of the Middle East, and in the interwar years, the most popular country in the in the Middle East by far was the United States. The people of the Middle East had had lots of experience of all the various uh, European empires. You know, Britain, France, Germany, the Germans were heavily into the Middle East, the Ottomans, the Russians. The United States was never involved in any of that. And as a result, it was universally light. Seems a strange thing to say today. Yeah. Uh, from Rumble, uh, C. Suliano says, your analysis and predictions have been so high quality that I have nothing but respect for you guys and the excellent guests you bring on. The discussions are so are so thoughtful. MSM can't touch this. Thank you for that. Thanks. Thank you very much. And from Locals, uh, Salustius8635 says, thank you. Thank you for that. And we go to Junior Plan. Welcome to the Durant community. NV Storm, welcome to the Durant community. And Sparky says, it's a good thing that such a peer can only be used for humanitarian aid to Gaza and not for nefarious purposes by Zionists and globalists. Well, we'll see what it is actually used for, but anyway, uh, I'm not going to add to what uh, Colonel Te Davis said. Uh, Te Teg Derb says, BB is not blind to what he's doing. This is the plan, sparring, sparing no one. BB is a very clever man. I mean, whatever you may think of him, whatever views you may have of him, he absolutely knows what he's doing. He calculates his every move and prepares for it carefully. Um, it is a major mistake to underestimate him. Um, that is why he has been Prime Minister of Israel for as long as he has. Sparky says, build a better world with bricks. Mm -hmm. Valley S, thank you very much for that super sticker. Peter, thank you for that super sticker. Sparky says, nerds are by definition socially challenged, so why are globalist nerds in charge of creating a social utopia? Well, this is a huge question, but can I just say, I mean, the reason they are um, so powerful is because, well, they work together and they've been very supported. I mean, there's all kinds of people, companies, businesses, corporations, all kinds of people who have wanted to support this project because they think they can benefit from it. Yeah, Franz Peterson, thank you for that super sticker. Nikos says, Colonel and Duran, you need to make a video with Dima. The Ukrainians are attacking nuclear power plants in Russia. And NATO's has, and NATO has 300,000 troops at the border. 300, right, right, right. I, I, I think That's, the 300, yeah, yeah. The, the three, that, yeah. That story has been spread around, about 300,000 yeah. troops at the border. But there's been a lot of analysis and discussion of this. And this is a wild exaggeration. I mean, there aren't basically that number of maneuver troops in NATO. The, the, the talk about setting up a 300,000 man force has been around for a very, very long time. And it's just not got off the ground. The reality about NATO militaries is that they are in a terrible condition. The British, the German, the French, none of them are really at the present time fit to conduct that kind of operation and there are not enough american troops in europe to create a force of this kind i, I don't quite know myself whether this three hundred thousand figure has come from but anyway it, it, it it's it's uh it's wrong and it's frightening people but as i said it, it it isn't it isn't true the other part of what you say however is absolutely correct the there nuclear. was a the nuclear one. They they were yeah. nuclear. Uh, there were drone attacks on a nuclear power station in Rostov, did minimal damage, but the Ukrainians have recently restarted the old game of launching strikes and attacks on the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant and things around it. It's a reckless and unbelievably dangerous thing, and I suspect that you know some people, Dima example that the military summary channel thinks it's intended to capture the nuclear power station i personally think it's intended to attract attention the ukrainians feel that everything is going wrong going very very badly wrong 
And they're in effect saying, look, we're, we're doing all of this. We're desperate. We're attacking this nuclear power plant. Come to our rescue, because if you don't, something really bad will happen. Nuclear power plant or something of that kind. So that is what I think this is all about. But it is scary and very bad. And it's terrible again that Western leaders don't call it out. Joe Public says APAC needs to be a proscribed organization. Well, I, I wouldn't go that far, but certainly it, it, it needs to be taken out of the loop of the decision making process in Washington. Its influence has never been good. And in my opinion, it's got both the United States and, by the way, Israel into a lot of into, into terrible trouble. Sir Muggs Game says, in the battle of the bookcases, Colonel Davis gets an, gets an honorable mention, but Alexander's still holds the title for oh, subtle you. sophistication. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, Sparky says, when someone proposes a two-state solution, it shows they're out of touch or running interference for Zionists as they work towards greater Israel. Well, can I just say, I know this uh, argument is made, and I know a lot of people say that if there ever was a possibility of a two-state solution, it's gone. And people who've been there um, in the place itself, um, to Palestine and Israel, a, a lot of them have said that. And they said that directly to me, people I know who've actually been there. What I say about it is this. It is currently the international consensus. It is what unites all the world. It is the basis of any kind of negotiation process. You're going to hold a negotiation process. It has to be based on that because there is nothing else at the present time. If a negotiation gets underway and it turns out over the course of that negotiation that a two-state solution is for many practical and good reasons unworkable, then the parties to a negotiation once that negotiation is underway, might be persuaded to find their way to some other solution instead. But for the moment, anybody who wants to get a negotiating process started has to start there. I mean, it may be, it may not be the end of the journey, but what do they say? Every journey of 100 miles must begin with a single step. Nico Early says, give us wisdom. Thank you for that. I am Valentina says, thank you, gentlemen, for your insight. Eric Hatchett says, it's just tactical nuclear weapons. Who catches the first one? Mm -hmm. Sparky says, how do we know Israel is not the 51st state? Because if Israel was the 51st state, they'd only control two senators. <laughs> Tech Derb says, if a two-state solution is impossible, it needs to be one state with equal rights and representation for everyone and apartheid. We might very well get to that point. But in order to get to that point, we must start negotiations. We must have discussions. I mean, it's the South African situation needed discussions. We have to get discussions. The international consensus, it's one that's been developed over many decades, one to which the Palestinians agreed, not all of them, but the Palestinian Authority agreed. The Israelis in the past have agreed to the Security Council is united around, is that you start with discussions about setting up a two-state solution. And then, as I said, if that doesn't, if that is unworkable and you need to find some other solution, perhaps a one-state solution with everybody exercising equal rights, but perhaps with some provisions that will safeguard the identity and culture of the two communities. Well, they could find their way there with goodwill, of which there is none at the moment, by the way, but which might develop over a negotiated process. You might get there. But I come back to what I said. Every journey of 100 miles must begin with a single step. And that's why I talk about it and why others do. Sparky says, make Ukraine Russia again. 
Well, this is what Dmitry Medvedev has just said that. I mean, yeah, exactly. that's exactly his. I mean, he talks about, you know, uh, victory, you know, the Ukrainians sorting everything out in their own country, and then, of course, preparing to reunite with Russia. <laughs> that, that is his solution, ultimate solution to this problem. And who knows? I mean, we're coming closer to that every day. Yeah. Alex Glantz, thank you for that super sticker. Sparky says, don't even leave a patch called Ukraine. At least it remains a NATO playground. Carpetbagger, money laundry, laundry, and becomes a BlackRock property. You and you and Dmitry Medvedev needs to get together and talk these through. I think you find a complete commonality of view on that. That is where we may end up. It's yeah. increasingly looking likely. Uh, that does Ed fifty says invaluable perspective as always, gentlemen. Know what's going on, Gonzalo Lira. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, Sir Muggs Game says, like the primordial forces say, you can believe anything, but not allowed to know anything. <laughs> True enough. That's Sparky says, yeah. Sparky says, how dare you question the superb leadership of our brave Jupiter, Emmanuel Macron? Gosh. <laughs> Good when people talk speech. about talk like that, Jupiter, I don't know, well, we, you know, we're all waiting. I mean, by the way, on that, uh, in that interview with Putin, T uh, uh, Kiselyov, the journalist, asked Putin, Putin straightforwardly, has Macron gone nuts? <laughs> it's quite, quite an astonishing question in some ways, because I think a lot of people are asking themselves that question, actually. I mean, what's come over him? I don't know. I'm I'm thinking it's something akin to to Clinton and NATO Serbia with the Lewinsky affair. Yeah, you may be right. S something will be right. Yeah, mm. that's dangerous. You, yeah, absolutely. I I'll say one thing by the way. Um, um, I was uh, looking at Le Mans uh, a short time ago, just before we started this program, and the French pop public don't like it. I mean, you know, we got European elections coming. And the gap between Macron's party and Le Pen's is increasing. She's well ahead now, and it's getting bigger. And it's largely, I think, because of this. Yeah, Tisham says, Russia has 4D chess masters. The collective West has remedial math monkeys. True enough. By the way, on chess, can I just say, there was there is a really superb American drama called the queen's gambit about an american woman chess player this is fiction it's complete fiction by the way who goes to russia in the 1960s and takes the russians on in chess and beats them and develops a huge respect for them as they do for her and i have to say it was one of the best programs fiction programs about russia i've ever seen you mm -hmm. don't get that kind of thing in europe any anymore so the fact that it's Things like that are coming out in the U.S. That also gives me hope. So somebody sign. brought up the subject yeah. of chess. It's a good sign, yeah. Klaus, yeah. Klaus, Klaus Vatner says, everybody knows that Macron knows the war is lost and that Putin won't invade Europe. The real question then is why is he pushing this? What is yeah. the real reason? I, I don't think anybody's come up with a fully satisfactory explanation. Kiselyov and um, Putin went on a long discussion about the fact that he's angry about the fact that the Russians have uh, been successful in West Africa and the French are being booted out of there. I can't quite believe that is the full explanation. I mean, it, it makes it all very childish, you know, because I've been booted out of West Africa, I'm going to start World War Three. I mean, it, it, it just doesn't quite makes sense to me. I, I, I agree with Alex. I think it has some ex internal cause. And anyway, whatever it is, it's it's becoming really dangerous. Commander Crossfire says, Russia is trying to keep casualties low on both sides. They are fighting their own people. It may be hard to understand, but Russia is not engaged in a real war. It's a special you know, military operation. You're absolutely right. And by the way, about the need to keep casualties low, Putin talked about that in the interview as well. Joe Public says Macron is scared to go to Kiev, but is happy to send others in his place. Yeah, absolutely. This is also true. Um, in case people don't know, he's he's again postponed his trip to Kiev. He's doing this all the time now. 
Yeah. Commander Crossfire says, don't believe for a nanosecond that Russia is, is ever thinking about nukes, maybe thought about escalating the SMO to anti-terror or even war, but nukes, come on. I don't think they would, uh, for one microsecond, use nukes if the war was confined to Ukraine. I mean, I, I don't think they would do that. I mean, I really don't. If we get into a situation where NATO starts to fight the Russians in Ukraine, well, we're, we're in a potentially catastrophic situation. Uh, N.B. Stormont says, Valley S deserves a raise. <laughs> she certainly does. <laughs> um, Mood Dragon says, what's your take on this entire Macron stupidity? Well, uh, you know, we're, we're undoubtedly going to cover this again, probably in a vi dedicated video tomorrow. But um, something has gone loopy with Macron. And, I, and we're not the only people saying that. Putin isn't the only person saying that. Right across Europe, even the British are stunned. I've been reading the British media and, you know, even arch neocon Putin haters, people who fervently support Ukraine, like uh, uh, a Hamish uh, de Breton Gordon, for example, are absolutely bewildered and baffled about what Macron is up to. So, you know, I, it, it's he's a very complicated man in a very strangely ineffective and um, odd way. So you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's coming up with some kind of overcomplicated scheme. He's got problems in France. There might be, as Alex correctly says, a, a, a you know a, a moment you know like the one we had with um, you know he's about to be caught with his pants down there was something about something quite close to that by the way short time ago in France I didn't get the whole story but apparently there was all kinds of revelations about things that he'd been up to which he found very embarrassing so you know there's probably something about that and you know maybe at some level he thinks, look, if I go in, I'll get the Americans on side or alternatively, I'll finally get some leverage over Putin and then he will start to take me seriously and I can become the mediator to end this crisis, which I've always wanted. He's got that kind of mind. Oh, it, it's too complicated. His mind is too complicated and it's very difficult for the rest of us to figure out what he's thinking. Samuel uh, Maroni says, is the West really producing 1.2 million per year? It would mean that the US and EU are producing 50,000 shells monthly, respectively. It seems a lot to me. You're right. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> it's as simple as that. I mean, I, um, I, I've heard um, on very good authority that the US manages to produce around 34,000 shells a month. That's more, by the way, than the Pentagon is saying itself. But, you know, maybe they are producing 34,000 shells a month. I don't think the Europeans are producing a fraction of that. Um, I'm fairly sure myself that when they're talking about 1.2 million shells, this is all based around the 800,000 shells that President Pavel of the Czech Republic thinks he's going to buy on the international arms market. I noticed, by the way, that the first delivery to Ukraine of those shells has now been put back to June, which makes me increasingly wonder whether they even exist. Yeah, Fragments of the USSR says, Simon Uralov recently analyzed a RAND report concluding that the US is moving to war on international criminal organizations narrative. Who will be potential targets of the new war on terror? Oh, my goodness. I haven't seen that I don't, report. I don't want, no, I haven't seen that report. I don't even want to think about that. I mean, th the previous war on terror didn't turn out well. Another one on top of that. Yeah. But I suppose uh, war, we always have to be at war with someone. That, that seems to be what the neocons always want us. Never the word peace. Elsa says, it seems like the globalist Westerners like Macron don't allow leaders into their club if their approval ratings are above 30%. Those are called dictators because they care and listen to their voters. You are so profoundly right about this. I mean, look at the level of support for leaders around the world. I think Macron is down to 17. Trudeau is lower than that. 
of Schultz is about 17 or so, and Sunak is about 9% approval. <laughs> I mean, it tells you what, what you know, this is, this is the coalition that's taking on Putin. Yeah. Uh, Vince says, hi, guys. Thank you for your great work. Don't you think there'll be a huge pushback from European citizens, given the huge unpop unpopularity our leaders are currently having if these fools try to military pit us against the Russians? Yes, I think there will be. I think this is the one thing I think first I, 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 I'm absolutely sure of this. If we start if the European and indeed American public start to sense that we're being dragged into a war with Russia, then there will be a, there will be there will be opposition, and it will grow, and it will spread, and it could easily spread out of control. Mm. Uh, Carrie Mache says you have an Islamophobic mod. D disgusting. An Islamic? Sorry, I don't no, understand. I don't know. Yeah, I don't understand. Um, I am Valentina says please have Professor Mirandi on your show. Yeah, absolutely. We've had him on. Uh, we've you, had, him, had on, him with Glenn, yeah. or, or with Glenn Deason, and definitely we should we should go again. Actually, he's absolutely. probably got many good things to say now. Yeah, uh, from Sparky, Dad recalled the boredom of the Great Depression, leaving him to read National Geographic's account of a handful of Americans camping out in Arabia for an oil partnership. Arabs liked Americans. Absolutely, completely true. You know the Saudis. One of the reasons they welcomed the Americans in the 30s was because they were fed up with the British. It's a fact. Hmm. Tisham says, could the Macron thing be it's, it's his way of getting out and a move up in the ranks since no one is ever held to account? They just get promoted. It's a very good quote. It's a very good thought, actually. Well, who knows? I, in theory... He's still got two years ahead of him as president of France. Two full years. Just think of that. Yeah. Bo Omega says about Macron's motive, if you can't stay young, you can at least stay immature. Red, green. Maybe the maybe he caught crazy from Dementia Joe. Sniffs the <laughs> Fragments of the USSR said, said Macron is annoyed that his uh, attractive mind, his attractive wife is causing. His minor attractive wife is accused of being a man. Another uh, yeah. Obama conspiracy has emerged. Yeah, <laughs> spurred on. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's, there's been, there's yeah, been, yeah, been we, know. Yeah, we know, we know, we know, we know. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, a wag the dog type of what? scenario. Yeah, uh, let's see. Brooklyn, Brooklyn Butterfly Arts says, "What's your opinion of the TikTok ban bill?" Is it protected against Chinese influence or protect state protect state control of the narrative on Israel and Ukraine? I don't know, to be honest. I mean, I, Alex, you're probably better understanding this than me. I mean, I get to say my only personal knowledge of TikTok is that it seems to be used by it or it used to be used by teenagers. <laughs> It seems to me you know, to, 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 to do little things. So I don't quite understand why it is seen as this great threat. I do understand it's Chinese owned. Maybe there is a threat there, but I mean, I don't quite know what, what it is or why Congress is debating a bill about it. It all seems a bit strange to me. Alex? Yeah, it's, it's well, on the one on the one hand, it's theft. I yeah. mean, you're taking a company. You're, you're, you're telling the company you can't operate in the United States unless you divest from your your mother corporation wherever it may be located in this instance it's bit dance in uh, in china but i think it's i think the general consensus is is pretty clear that uh this is just a way to to get more control of the of the social yeah. media space yeah, yeah. and yeah. i mean it's it's very much i mean everyone is is saying is likening this to to a type of patriot act you know you start yeah. with one type of definition of of of, of what's allowed and and then you and or what's not allowed, and then you brought it out to to cover the the uh, the, the rest of the public. I mean, I think after TikTok, make, makes yeah, sense. after TikTok, you'll that have Telegram. Sense. They'll go after Telegram, and they'll yeah. say it's Russian propaganda. And eventually, they'll get to to Truth Social or uh, yeah. or or Twitter X. Even who knows? Yeah, makes and, and sense. I wouldn't be su and I wouldn't be surprised if you have the big social media companies like Facebook, Meta. Behind the scenes, pushing for for TikTok to go because 
you know, TikTok is a, is a big application. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, yes. You know, I, and I it's, it's it, yeah. And it's out, out. It comes from outside their eco world, isn't it? I mean, yeah, that they exactly. Just, They're not part of the club. Yeah. And, and the, the interesting part about TikTok, though, is that it's it censors content like crazy. Yeah. I mean, we we, we probably could never have a, an account on TikTok. I mean, it censors everything. Yeah. So so I mean, you know, it's I, I think that's that's what this is all about. Yeah. It's all about power and control. Yeah. And money. Because if BitDance says, okay, take take TikTok, fine, we, we submit, well, then, you know, it's going to be a lot of money to be made. Uh, Shark Ark Heart says, the peer build in Gaza will probably be used to deport the Palestinians in Europe forever by sea. Won't it? Yeah. Well, this is, this is what uh, Daniel Davis was talking about. Um, to be straightforward, I wouldn't be surprised if some people in Israel have that at the back of their minds. Whether it will actually ever happen is an entirely different matter. I personally think there would be huge opposition. And, you know, millions of people from Gaza coming to Europe. I mean, Europeans won't like it. European public won't like it. I mean, they'd presumably land in Italy first or Spain. Come here. Yeah. Communism Incorporated says, why do neocons insist on containment measures against the Chinese? The trajectory of events points towards the policy ending in utter failure. China will surpass these pressures and economically win. Yeah, well, when have the neocons ever worried about things like that? I mean, do they do they ever do they ever look thing do they ever look forward and um, you know understand that if they st- do these things it will always fail they never think like that that is what they do look at how completely wrong they got russia by the way putin had a lot to say about that in the interview as well and he confirmed by the way or at least he didn't confirm he agreed with our analysis that it was all ultimately about uh, regime change the whole ukraine thing he said almost exactly the same things that we say that they started with economic sanctions and thought that would create a crisis there and then they moved on to military things and that didn't work so anyway just saying uh klaus Wagner says is it possible that these leaders are fed with and believe the propaganda i thought they got briefings from the intelligence community intelligence community how do you know that the intelligence community gives them correct briefings i asked that question because it turns out that the intelligence community now regularly takes what it calls evidence from open source social media outlets, you know, like Oryx and others like that. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the information they're getting is bad. Um, we've discussed this many times. Um, you remember we did the program recently with Tony Schaffer, and I discussed how I thought intelligence was collected. And by the way, I just ought to say, you know, when I said all of those things, that in terms of military things, you investigate who the commander on the other side is, what the resources behind him are, or the factories, the, you know, all of that, all those, all those sort of things. I wasn't talking off the top of my head. In the legal worlds, when there's battles between big law firms, litigation, that is exactly what they do. They research the lawyer on the other side. They find out exactly what that person is like. How, you know, they try to predict that person's moves. They look at the resources of the client, whether the client is backed by insurance, how the, what the policies of the insurance company is. They do all that kind of proper, proper um, analysis and data collection before they get into a big legal battle. I've been involved in that kind of thing. And I assumed that intelligence agencies do the same. They don't any longer. And that was what Tony Schaffer basically told us. Yeah. And and don't discount the fact that leaders today get a lot of their information from the mainstream media, from the BBC, CNN, New York Times, Washington Post. Correct. I know a lot of people that that, that are making decisions for, for countries, smaller countries, but they're in positions of power and they base their policy on what they read on CNN, the Washington Post, and the New York Times. This is a, yep. this is a fact. 
Absolutely. It's a scary fact. But... It's a scary fact. I, I, I know that British cabinet ministers get their information principally from the newspapers. I absolutely know that. For yeah. a fact. Spark yeah. Sparky says, come to Jesus as a metaphor, meaning to get back on the straight and narrow, get your head right or wake up to reality. But its original religious meaning was somehow lost on Biden's hand. Yes. Thank you for that, Sparky. Sherry, thank you for that super chat. Sparky says, strict use of a uh, C CPAP, CPAP, even for a five-minute nap can help many dementia patients. Biden benefits from having people insur insuring he doesn't doze off without his CPAP. So he may not need go pills. No, <laughs> absolutely. Can I just say, I mean... <laughs> Again, speaking as somebody with, with certain beliefs, the president of the United States invoking the name of Jesus after he's engaged in what it, as it turns out, is a deeply manipulative speech. I have to say, it leaves me speechless. Mm. Yeah. Um, and Mr. Scott says, does Hebrew prophecy dictate Israeli policy? I don't think so. I, I, I can. I, I mean, if, if we're talking about Netanyahu himself, he strikes me as completely secular, and you can see his tradition. The tradition that he comes from goes all the way to a man back to a man called Jakubitsky, who is a very, very prominent um, ideologue. Um, you know, within the larger movement in the 1920s and whose uh, secretary was apparently Netanyahu's, either his father or his grandfather. So that's where Netanyahu himself comes from. There is, within the cabinet, apparently a group of um, uh, officials, cabinet ministers, who really do apparently want to rebuild the temple and to establish Israel, greater Israel. Uh, along what they say were its biblical boundaries. And apparently they are growing with growing in influence all the time. But I don't think this is what drives Netanyahu himself. I think Alistair Crook was talking Absolutely. about that on, on a He's show that, that, that we did here. Yeah. Absolutely. On that very point. Yeah. He brilliantly. Brilliantly. Yeah. Joe Public says Abby Martin or Whitney Webb would be great guests. Yeah. Yes, they would. They would. We will. We will try to to reach out to them. Um, let's see. I think that's everything, Alexander. Well, yeah. Saying, if it was everything, it's an amazing program, by the way. And uh, well, we are in scary times. I have to say, I mean, it's scary. I never expected that the person who would perhaps be leading us into Armageddon would be Emmanuel Macron of all people. I mean, it, it, you, know, I, you know, to have survived Victoria Newland to only to be led to catastrophe by Emmanuel Macron. I mean, it's almost, it almost beggars belief. Well, I, I think we'll get through. Let's this see now. what he says. Yeah. Well, let's see what he says. And I think we'll get through this. I mean, I wouldn't, I, I, I think that, you know, he's, very much the sort of person who I think you know will lead the will lead his troops up the hill and down again. <laughs> I don't think it's going to. I mean, that's that's ultimately what will happen with him. But anyway, still, one thing to always remember about Macron, and we've said it on many uh, shows that we've done covering Macron, is that he is he is a flip flopper. He says one thing today yeah. changes his mind tomorrow. So even if he comes out today and says crazy stuff tomorrow. He could yeah. come out and, and say Putin's my best friend. I mean, that that's Macron. Absolutely. The, the guy's Completely. constantly changing, changing yeah. his positions. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. So well, well, let's see what he says. Let's see what he, he says. Did. We'll all be watching. All right. Uh, thank you to everybody who watched us on Odyssey, Rumble, YouTube, Rockfin, and vduran.locals.com thank you to our guest lieutenant colonel daniel davis once again his information is in the description box down below as well as uh, a pinned comment when this live stream ends i will have the link to his youtube channel as a pinned comment and uh, thank you to our moderators our fantastic moderators spartan warrior queen tish m valley s uh Uwe, um, who 
well. Sariel, uh, Peter, and I think Reckless Abandon. And uh, I think that's everybody. Did I miss a moderator? I think so. All right, um, Alexander, let's. Uh, fantastic program. Uh, Thanks to everyone. Let's sign off. Take care, everybody.